Hey, we're alive. Wow, that happened again. It snuck uh, up on us. Call, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. Rick, Rick Beyer here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, and we're off to a great start. And we haven't even started drinking yet. So it's, uh, well, most of us haven't. Well, <laughs> uh, at least half of us haven't. I, I just did a Julia Child cooking sort of dinner, so that was a little kind of helpful. There you go. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, to History Happy Hour. Uh, we're talking here about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages, and all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. And, of course, we are just uh, doing our traditional delaying action for a moment or two to give people a chance to sign on. And and who, who have we got here, Chris, uh, signing on with us? Oh, we have, have Lizzie in London, uh, Tony in Philly, uh, Kevin from the Hudson Valley, and uh, Terry, whoop, Terry just moved on me. I know. Terry's from Jersey. Yeah, we have Kathy first, yeah. and uh, uh, Jack Sadler. Doug McCord says hello from the Keystone State. I believe that's Pennsylvania. That's ah. my extensive knowledge of state nicknames tells me that. Um, so Thomas and Emily from uh, West Virginia. And yes, Marcus, we are going to try to get through the entire history of the world and all six drinks in the hour, you know, and don't bet against us. <laughs> Chris, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Let's let's hit it. Let's hit it. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open. And boy, do we have the perfect history happy hour topic we today. We do. The history of the world in six glasses. This might be one of the best ones ever. And Chris, did you, I, I want you, did you, did you, did you see? The I, don't have the, I don't have the spread that you have, but I, I have supplemental beverages I have, this week. I have the all six. And I want to just say, anybody in our audience who's there, um, if you got anybody who brought more than one drink to today's show in honor of our topic, let us know how many you brought and what you brought because we want to hear about it. So That's we're right. excited to hear about the drinks that you have. And hey, Phil, here in Chicago, good to see you. So um, but as, as you're thinking about that or maybe you're running to the fridge to get some more drinks to deal with our topic today, uh, I want to introduce our guest today. His name is Tom Standage, and he is an author and journalist who is currently the deputy editor of The Economist newspaper and the editor-in-chief of The Economist's website and digital platform. He was telling us about all sorts of interesting tech things the other day. Uh, he's a graduate of Oxford, so we know he's a lot smarter than either Chris or I. Uh, and he has a degree in engineering and computing. This which is, is really smart of them. What you need when you're writing about history, I think. Yeah, uh, what's that all about? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know. Look, you go in a different direction, it's okay. And uh, he's the author, I think, of six books. Is that right, Tom? Well, I've, I've written the seventh, but it hasn't come out yet. It comes uh, out next year. Yeah, so, we're yes. not going to count that. So it's six books, okay. uh, and uh, including the Victorian Internet, a personal favorite of mine, and the new York Times bestseller, The History of the World in Six Glasses. Tom Standage, welcome. Great to be here. Cheers. And what are you Cheers. drinking? So I'm drinking a sparkling wine, and it's a Chandon from Argentina, funnily enough. So uh, Moet and Chandon, and it is Moet, that's the correct way to pronounce it, apparently. Um, the Great Champagne House has affiliates around the world. And I've been to the one in Napa Valley where they have a, uh, a restaurant and a winery and so on. And they do, uh, that's Domaine Chandon. Uh, and they also have, a, uh, they're, they're, I don't know where all of them are, but I know they have another one in Argentina. And this is their sparkling wine from Argentina. So it's very oh, nice. Excellent. Kind of classic new world, except Argentina's kind of old world because they really did get started on the winemaking <laughs> you know quite quite far quite long ago i mean maybe not totally old world but um but anyway yeah so it's uh it's got that kind of biscuity brioche nose that i really like and it's a bit less austere that's definitely the first champagne. time that anybody has used the phrase biscuity brioche nose well that's what I'm, I'm all about with sparkling wines i'm all about the um the the brioche nose and the 
yeah that's i just think that's the way sparkling wine should taste and the thing is that champagnes are all like oh no we must be very serious we must be very austere and dry <laughs> and hardly smell of anything and i'm like really what's the point so i'm much much bigger fan of, uh, of new world um of sparklers i have to confess well thank you everybody for joining us today i think that's our uh, no okay chris what are you what have you got going on there well i i'm gonna i'm starting uh with a london porter uh which it's Marks and Spencer's brand, but surprisingly really very good. Uh, and it's based on a recipe from 1750. At least that's what they say. Well, I have, uh, I have, I'm starting with beer because I know that's our first of our, of our six drinks. So I'm, oh. I'm drinking it out of my lining Kugel glass. I am actually drinking a two hearted ale, uh, and have tried to, with the help of Marilyn Ray Byer, come up with a drink appropriate for each part of our broadcast. And so, they may have to pick me up off the floor after we're done. <laughs> I, I should confess, I had beer earlier on, so I started uh, earlier okay, in good. history, so and I've like moved on. To, <laughs> and I'm ready for the, I don't want to. I don't want to like give away anything, but I'm, I'm ready for the next period in history with some bourbon here as well. So, uh, so I'm, like, I'm totally like a, prepared. Yeah, a time traveler. A yeah, time that's traveler. the idea. Um, uh, uh, Tom, uh, the the. Why don't you start out by giving us a little bit of, a, of an overview. And the thing about your book that I think is interesting, not to steal your thunder, um, it's not simply that there are six drinks that we can come up with, which, by the way, for people are beer, beer, wine, spirits, coffee, tea, and cola. Yay. There's not simply six drinks that represent the span of the course of civilization, although they do, but that each of them in its own way is kind of an important driver in history in its time yeah so i suppose um this is a this was a bit of a unusual swerve for me because yeah my background my education uh was in engineering and then i became basically a science journalist and i wrote three books that were about analogies in the history of science and technology and uh so victorian internet was one of them and then i wrote a book about astronomy and then i wrote a book about the mechanical turk which was a machine that played chess in the 1770s, 1780s, and led to a whole debate about artificial intelligence. So that was all sort of home ground for me, which was the history of science and technology and what um, stories from the past could tell us about modern technologies, whether it was the internet or planet hunting, because we're finding all these planets around other stars, or artificial intelligence. So that was kind of my shtick as a, as a historian. Uh, or a history writer. I wouldn't call myself a historian because I'm not really a historian. I'm not qualified to be a historian. Um, anyway, my um, my accountant said, oh, well, you should write a book about wine because then you could like, you know, everything would be tax deductible. It would be research. <laughs> I thought, oh, ha, 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 that's really funny. And then I thought, you know, that's a really good idea. Um, so I started thinking about, could I do a history of the world through wine? I just read um, Guns, Germs and Steel. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to write a world history. I'm going to write one of those, you know, one of those books that kind of covers the history of everything and makes you makes you you know change the way you think about it anyway so i went and looked at the history of wine and um and it was kind of i was interested in the greek and roman stuff i thought that was really interesting and the way that the greeks used wine and the relationship with philosophy and all that kind of thing um but the rest of the history of wine i was just not quite so excited by i mean you know then there was phylloxera and then there was you know i just was like okay this isn't terribly exciting so there's a period of it where i really like it and then when i and i thought well wine must be the oldest you know alcoholic drink so that would obviously you'd start with that and then you'd end up with what i don't know the triumph of new world wine and the judgment of paris all that kind of stuff so i could sort of see the arc of the history of the world in wine but it but it's going to end up being the history of wine not the history of the world and the point where it really intersects with history and what's going on and what's the most important thing in history at the time, um, or at least from a sort of, you know, classical Western perspective. Uh, so people are inventing philosophy and democracy and stuff like that, and they're doing it with wine. Um, so there's a point where wine's really interesting and then the rest of the time, not so much. And then it turns out wine isn't the oldest alcoholic drink. Uh, there are older ones um, like mead and beer. Um, you need pottery to make wine. You don't need pottery to make um, to make beer, or at least a kind of beer. Uh, and similarly with mead, you can you can sort of get away with it. Um, so I thought, OK, so you've sort of got beer, then you've got wine. Um, and then I looked at, you know, what were the other uh, drinks that were significant? And I thought I knew about tea in the British Empire. So that was an obvious one. And then I knew about Coca-Cola and it's sort of as a symbol of America and globalization. And then I also knew about because one of my favorite periods in history is the scientific revolution. And um, and so what's happening in England and of course kind of northern Europe in the 1660s and people are sort of realizing the Greeks are wrong and they're starting to challenge everything and do experiments and so on and that all goes it turns out hand in hand with coffee um so then I had a gap which was how do I get from wine to coffee 
Um, and dessert uh, is usually the answer. <laughs> well, so what I did was, I was funny enough. I was. It's funny you should say that because I, I specifically remember I was walking to the cheese shop, and the house I used to live in was in the same street as a cheese shop. And this was because when my wife and I uh, we got married and we wanted to buy a house and we wanted to move back to the neighbourhood where we where we grew up, and. Um, so we said to the estate agent, we said, we want to, you know, let us know if anything comes up in the street with the cheese shop, because we love going to the cheese shop. And, you know, whenever we're, we're, we used to you know, have Saturdays, cheese days and things when we were younger. Um, anyway, a house came up in that street literally two days later and we went and saw it and we bought it straight away. And so um, I was walking to the cheese shop and uh, when I was writing, well, I was, I was thinking about this book, I was developing this book. And I realized that what I should do is the third drink, the gap was not a single drink it's the it's the idea of distillation and it's spirits in general so that's how you get beer wine spirits coffee tea cola covering the whole thing and so i then had my structure and i was like okay i could do the history of the world in six drinks and each drink is um is there's a sort of crucial period where the drink is connected to and represents what's happening in the world the main thing that's happening at least in the western world and how that then um you know, inter interferes or influences with that process. So, so in some cases, it, it, the drink isn't just sort of symptomatic of what's happening; it actively influences what's happening. And you you see this specific, specifically with things like the you know the tea trade or uh, coffee as an alternative to alcohol, sort of sharpening people's minds. And it's, that's, is that why you get the scientific revolution? Maybe so. Um, so, and then uh, in the spirits period, you get spirits are used as a currency. Um, in the slave trade and so on and so on. So they, they really are instrumental in, in different ways. And so then I had my structure and so I wrote this book. And I suppose what this, the reason I mentioned all the technology stuff at the, at the beginning is that um, for me, I'm really seeing each drink as a technology. And the three books that I'd written before were about the social impact of technologies. And I was making the point that people react to old technologies in the past the way that we react to them today so the reactions of people to the the telegraph network the victorian internet are just the same as the reactions of people to the internet so they say oh this will never take off oh it's terrible um and then some people are like hey we could really make some money from this and other people come up with new forms of crime and you get online romances and all this kind of stuff and then similarly you know with the other books you get the same reaction so the point that runs through all of my writing is that the technologies come and go but human nature stays the same and this is the same story again just with drinks and so so um, what I love about drinks and the history of drinking is that they, they are, I call them living fossils or, or they're kind of links to the past um, because they are they're aspects of the past that survive into the present day. So beer is a Stone Age drink and wine is a, you know, is a slightly later, but still a pretty ancient drink. And we're still drinking it today. And I like to think that if you got in a co into a time machine and you stumbled out into you know, pretty much any period at all, you stumbled out onto the into the Neolithic you know, village, um, and you wouldn't be able to communicate to anyone at all because you wouldn't have any language in common. But eventually someone would go, do you want a drink? And you'd go, yeah, totally. And, um, <laughs> and that, would be the, that would be the point at which, you know, we would, we would be able to communicate because that's something that, that idea of hospitality around, around um, uh, sharing a glass of something or sharing some vessel of something because we've only had glasses relatively recently, that's really, you know, the, 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 what makes these technologies so powerful. So, so Tom... Um... What is the the earliest reference then to to I go you start with beer so what would be kind of the starting point of the story how does that how do well, we get the earliest going reference, earliest reference means that you're talking about writing and you're talking about history and of course writing is much much later writing kind of starts around 3400 BC 3200 BC and the first um, written documents are uh tablets that are basically ration records and they include references to beer so uh, and one of the things that beer connects to is the sort of origin of civilization cities writing um taxation here we go so um you can see on this cuneiform tablet well, this is this is um you can see those sort of uh those i think this is upside down actually <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you, you can see uh you can see the bottom right there what looks like a a, a pot is an upside down pot and you can see it's a it's an amphora sort of you know big clay jar that sunk into the ground and that's what the beer would have been made in and the symbol for beer was that that sign and those other yeah here we go so you can see that that symbol there and you right, can I got see this how it, one upside up right okay. yeah this one's the right way up exactly <laughs> so th 3200 bc which is about as early as you can find any written document but beer is much older than that so beer goes back to probably 10 or 12000 bc um because when people start gathering grains and they start lobbing them into soup and then maybe someone leaves some overnight and they're not cooking them in pottery. They're cooking them in like animal intestines over a fire. Mm. And they're heating them by dropping stones into them. 
Um, but you can you can basically accidentally make beer using that process, and you 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 know find some of this leftover gruel or porridge the next morning, and you drink it, and it'd go, oh, this is kind of nice. It's fizzy, and it makes me feel happy. And <laughs> so then people would have set out to try and replicate that, and they'd have figured out that if you put more sugary stuff into it, um, you've got more sugar to ferment into alcohol. We now know, but they would have discovered this by trial and error. So yes, by the time you get to the first cities and the first settled um, communities. Um, everyone is drinking beer and they are drinking beer. They're not drinking wine. And in fact, everywhere in the world that you look, as soon as you get settled agriculture, people are drinking beer and they're making it from whatever the local grain is. So it's, you know, it's rice in some parts of the world or millet in, actually it's millet in, um, uh, in China and it's, it's sorghum or something like that in Africa. And then it's, um, it's, it's wheat and barley in, uh, in, in, uh, sort of Eurasia and so on and so on. And so it seems to be a universal thing. People figure out how to ferment alcohol. And some people go as far as to suggest that the reason that nomadic people settled down was in order to maintain the beer supply. Because with other kinds of food, you can you, know, you can chase after a woolly mammoth and you know wherever you're staying, you can find a nearby woolly mammoth and kill it and eat it. Um, <laughs> but with beer, you actually have to grow... Um, you, you, well, you don't grow them deliberately to start with. You just... you If you stay near wild stands of barley, you can gather them and you can um, you can ferment them into beer and um and so it makes sense to kind of stay in one place where you're near the barley so you can grab it when it's ready um and then people would have started planting it deliberately so there are this is a sort of beer theory of civilization that says that one of the reasons that people settle down is that they love beer it starts to become religiously significant and um and therefore in order to maintain access to it people actually switch from a nomadic lifestyle to an agricultural lifestyle and then there's a big debate about whether agriculture is like in the long run a good idea or not because right. um the, the the quality of life is much lower and the health of people is much lower and their you know their, their longevity is much lower but they get to have beer yeah, um, yeah. and also yes. and also by the time after about ten thousand years of agriculture so you know about sort of 150 years ago um the quality of life suddenly becomes much better than being a uh, hunter gatherer but um up until that point it really wasn't that much better particularly well, for most people i mean it was for the very very wealthy but now it kind of in most you know settled societies you have a better standard of living than a hunter gatherer um so in the long run <laughs> agriculture ended up being a good thing but um but yeah it was um you know we're very fortunate that we live in a period where uh, we get to enjoy the fruits of agriculture and we also get to have you know shelter and, and yeah, a yeah. good diet and that sort of thing so Tom, I actually I, can I ask a following question Rick absolutely so you talked about you know drinking and it's kind of a universal thing and you could go back in time um, and they would offer you a drink of whatever they were drinking um, in case I'm about I'm thinking about you know all right I'm getting ready to go back in time and I want to go back to the earliest days of beer um, should I bring a six-pack with me would I recognize what I'm drinking no, I don't think you would, because um, modern beer is very different from the beer that's existed oh, for most of history. And that's because it has hops in it. So hops are a very recent addition to beer. They were only added in the medieval period, about ooh, 12th, 13th century, we think. Um, and before that, beer was very different. And if you have a recreation of an older beer, and they do exist, and I've had a few of them, um, they're much uh, sweeter because you don't have the... Uh, you don't have the hops to balance the sweetness of the malt. Um, and so other things we use to balance the sweetness instead. So juniper is quite a common choice mm -hmm. and other herbs and so on. But um, the really striking thing about uh, older beers and uh, sort of archaeological, experimental archaeologists who recreate them, um, is that beer tastes a lot more like wine. Um, and in fact, there is a continuum between beer and wine because early beers would have been made with grains that were fermented, but they would have thrown in some fruit as well because that was a way of making the beer stronger. And we know this, there were Egyptian records of, you know, 15 different kinds of beers and they've all got slightly different recipes. Um, so the really striking thing is that um, then, of course, you may have less grain and you have more fruit, then it's starting to turn into wine because wine right. is fermented fruit and, and beer is fermented grain. Um, and uh, what, what my favorite reference to this is there's a Mesopotamian reference and the Mesopotamians are... Um, they're a beer drinking culture and we you know they invent writing and they have cities and you know and they are using beer basically as a currency and everyone is drinking it and um nearby in the zagros mountains uh in what's now iran uh that's where the first wine making happens and um wine is this very expensive drink that's brought down the river into the mesopotamian cities and only the very very wealthiest people can afford it and there's a reference to 
uh, to wine in one of these Mesopotamian texts. I think it's an Assyrian period text. And, it's, and it refers to wine as that excellent beer of the mountains. In other words, it's regarded as like a very fancy kind of beer. And uh. the reason is that, um, is that beer tasted a lot more like wine in those days. Um, and now we kind of think of beer, I mean, particularly now with this sort of insane arms race with the IPAs where let's see how, uh, uh, see how hoppy we can make them. And, if, you know, you can barely taste them. And then if you can actually get to the end of a, you know, a modern American IPA, uh, you wake up in the morning and you're completely dehydrated. You know, your yes. tongue is completely, I, I, I just can't, I can't drink these sort of insane and some of them even they put the um, IBU number, the International Bitterness Unit, on the can because <laughs> they they're boasting about just just how many hops there are and how bitter they are. But anyway, that's a very very recent development, both sort of in the last twenty years with the IPAs, but also um, in the last seven hundred years with the use of hops. So yeah, it would be rather different. Well, we we have an echo of today's craft uh, beer wars in the. Um, in the variety of beers that they had in ancient Egypt. And as you wrote, I'll, I'll quote from you, Tom, I'm sure that's always fun, right, when people do that. Uh, you mentioned all the kinds of beer. Egyptian records mentioned 17 kinds of beer, and some of them referred to in poetic terms that sound to modern ears almost like advertising slogans. Different beers were known as the beautiful and good, the heavenly, the joy bringer, the addition to the meal, the plentiful and the fermented. So these guys, they may not taste like modern beers, but they are enjoying their beer. So, so they, they have are. like, but then they have like microbrew labels then though. I, who, well, who knows? Well, I mean, the thing is that they <laughs> stone that they. The yeah. funny thing is that well, everyone's making beer at home, right? So, so um, I mean, my mum makes. I grew up with my mum making beer at home, and uh, the idea that you know that that you make beer at home and then you drink it that's uh, totally normal. But um, in ancient Egypt, the children were drinking beer as well. Right. Um, so there was a small beer, as we would call it. So it was very light, light in alcohol, and it was that was the kind of standard drink, um, and it was. Uh, you know, it was basically a kind of every everyday drink. And, and there's a, an Egyptian text where it says, you know, uh, a good mother is someone who sends her children to school with beer every day. You know, if you don't do that, then you're just failing in your your duty as a mother. <laughs> uh, but the other the other thing from this period that I think is um, is very recognizable, aside from this kind of variety of beers, um, is the idea that beer is the is the drink, you know, the honest drink of the working man. So right. the people who built the pyramids were paid in bread and beer and onions. And we've got the records that shows this. So it was used as an agricultural wage. And the people who built the pyramids were basically agricultural workers who were off season um, taken to, to build the pyramids. It used to be thought they were built by slaves. They weren't. They were built by uh, agricultural workers who were paid. Um, and and uh, we also see um, the idea that um, beer is sort of the drink that brings people together. And this, I think, goes back to the idea that so beer was originally fermented in Mesopotamia in these big earthenware jars. And the way you would drink it is everyone would put a straw into it. And I think there may be a picture of that. There's a picture of that in the book. Um, and it's a an image um, from a Mesopotamian, you know, pictogram. Uh, no, that's a Syria. That's so wine uh, that's one. wine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you've sorry. moved on to Ashurbanipal and wine now. But um, I, but yeah, I, if you at go, least it's if, not upside down. Yeah, but well, that's true. <laughs> but if you if you go back to uh, if you, there's a there is a um, this this was a thing that people would drink from a single vessel and, and drinking beer together was something you kind of had to do it because you'd have a straw and there would still be stuff floating on the surface of the beer and to get through past the chaff and the wheat and stuff on the top you would stick your straw in and then you would drink the beer so it was something you did together and when we um when we raise a glass we're sort of invoking the religious connotations of alcohol which are extremely ancient but when we bring glasses together and say cheers we are symbolically reuniting our glasses in a single vessel which is how um how beer would originally have been drunk and we see the same with wine as well and so the the greek um, ritual of the symposium is all about sharing wine and drinking from a shared vessel and so this is you know the social significance of these technologies because that's what they are um you know can't be overstated so uh you know i don't I'm almost out of my IPA here, which has been very <laughs> harassed in the, in the program. Yeah, I know, I know. But... Uh, we, uh, we, we were almost on the verge of getting an IPA maker as a sponsor, but I guess that won't be happening. Well, an APA, an APA. See, I like American Pale Ale, which is basically a lighter style of, AP, of IPA, isn't it? Um, so... And, and I, the last thing, I, I just uh, sort of a, as a, an outro on beer before we get to wine, is you know one of the things with beer also is – um, one of the threads that runs through that story is that people are drinking it instead of water, 
um, that people are, and it, this becomes important for wine, it becomes important for tea. Also well, actually for all on. of them. So so all one of them. the reasons why all of these drinks are so, so, so they have this sort of social function, they have a religious function, they very often have a medical function as well. Um, they're, they're often literally used as medicines. Um, so in, again, Egyptian medical texts, uh, if you're a doctor and you want to uh, make either a sort of, you know, something to rub on people um, or or a, a potion, you know, then you use beer as the base of it because you know that beer is going to be sterile, unlike water, because beer is made using boiled water. So it's safer to drink than water. Um, and if you're going to mix up a concoction of herbs or whatever, you're going to use beer as the base. Um, and then later on, you know, we get uh, throughout history, you've got all of these drinks where either the alcohol kills things or the, or the process of making the alcoholic drink. So it's boiling in the case of beer. In the case of wine, it's the tannins, which are naturally antibacterial. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, and then spirits, you know, we use spirits as a disinfectant now. <laughs> so we recognize that, you know, that they are a way of, of and they were regarded as a miracle uh, medicine when they were first uh, discovered. Um, and then uh, with coffee and tea, you're boiling the water. And so we see an enormous uh, drop in, uh, waterborne disease uh, in Britain when tea comes in and is popular. You've got all these people living together in cities and suddenly they start drinking tea and the uh, the rate of infant mortality and, and, you know, generally infectious diseases plummet because people aren't drinking bad water quite so much and they're boiling it first. So, yes, there's this medicinal function. And the, the, it's probably wine that's the uh, the best example of that. And, and Galen, we'll probably get to him in a minute, right? Well, so you're going to move on to wine now. I'm on wine already, obviously. So, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just, you, you ask a question. I'll catch up. Well, I'll, 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 well, well, start us with wine, and, and, and Galen is certainly interesting, but we can go back to the, the, the Greeks and Romans and the development of Western thought, and I will just, just to get it in now before you launch on this, this wonderful quote from a Roman epitaph, Baths, wine, and sex ruin our bodies. But what makes life worth living except baths, wine, and sex? <laughs> there you go. So that's very relatable, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the hinge here is the Assyrians, who we just saw, you showed a picture of uh, a moment ago, and there's uh, Ashurbanipal, I think it is, holding a, a dish of wine. Uh, so there he is holding. Now, that thing he's holding up there is um, is a dish of wine, and the people waving those sort of bananas over the top of it, they're actually uh, they're, they're swatting the flies away from him. Um, but what's what's interesting about this? This is a, a middle, a Near Eastern culture um, that is associated with beer, and wine is a very expensive drink that only the elite can afford. And um, and what starts to happen is that this, the cultivation of wine becomes much more widespread. And uh, in the Assyrian period, wine becomes more important than beer. It overtakes beer, and it becomes widespread enough that you know, more people can have it. And then what happens in the Greek and Roman periods? is that um, wine becomes so widespread. So there's just enormous cultivation of wine in, um, in Greece and the Greek colonies around the Mediterranean. And then in Italy, uh, what is Italy now? And so the Greeks and the Romans end up, they're entirely wine-based cultures, and they end up looking down their noses at beer and beer drinking cultures as the, you know, the heathen cultures that came before them. And it's like, you know, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. Well, they may have thought they were clever with their hieroglyphics and their writing <laughs> and their cities, but, you know, they all had to drink beer. I mean, how unsophisticated is that? Whereas we, Greeks and Romans, we're so awesome that even the slaves in our culture get to drink wine. That was a pretty horrible kind of wine, actually, that the, that the slaves ended up with. But it really was this sort of measure of sophistication that um, and this persists to this day, the idea that <laughs> so, beer... so wine, wine snobbery goes back for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that old. It really is that old. <laughs> and it, and, and um, I mean, it's, it's like millennia old. And, um, and so this idea that beer is the kind of honest drink of the working man, but it's not terribly sophisticated. And if you're like really smart, then you drink wine and wine shows how clever you are. And, you know, so when when you have world leaders and they have a banquet and, you know, particularly if they're in France, it's like, of course, they drink wine. They're not going to drink beer because, you know, they're the rulers of the world. They have to have the most sophisticated thing. And, you know, um, and what does what does the prime minister serve when we have people come to Britain? Well, it has to be English sparkling wine now, of course, because that shows that we can make wine in Britain, which means we're sophisticated and civilized and you know all this kind of stuff so so yeah it is the it's the king of drinks because and the drink of kings because it's the most um sophisticated drink and it's the drink with all of this scope for connoisseurship and you know it's ridiculously expensive you know you can, it can be ridiculously expensive whereas that doesn't really happen with beer so it is the, it's just got this sort of edge on beer that it's much much more sophisticated and so the the cultures that you that you get sort of reflect that and the uh, in two different ways so that in the greek in the greek culture uh, greek culture is all about sort of ordered competition uh, so in philosophy in sport in the in the law courts 
um, you know, there are rules and then you have sort of a, a, basically a ritual fight. Um, and uh, the symposium, which is the Greek wine drinking party, is the sort of microcosm of that, where everyone's trying to outdo each other with, you know, the cleverest joke and they flick wine at each other and, you know, and they get drunk together and come up with philosophical witticisms and, and you get the, the Greek philosophical text in the form of a symposium. And then what happens in the Roman period is the Romans are really into their sort of, you know, hierarchy, the class system. Um, and the idea that there's a, a, there's a suitable wine for every social rank. And so the emperor drinks the best wine of all, which is Falernium, and the slaves drink the worst wine of all, which is Posca, uh, which is often translated as vinegar. This is what Christ is given on the cross by the, the centurion who dips a sponge um, in basically his wine ration. Uh, and uh, Roman soldiers were given um we're given a sort of a liter of this uh this stuff kind of vinegary wine uh, and that's what so it's not a punishment he's actually giving christ wine that's the that's the point it's uh, he's being nice to him um but anyway if you if you look at this my favorite example is there's um, during one of the civil wars of course which the romans had many i think it was the social war um there's somebody who runs away and hides in the house um of one of his supporters and um uh, and so, of course, they've got this eminent Roman general who's on the run from, you know, whoever's just taken over um, and they're hiding him under the stairs or whatever. And they're like, well, we can't possibly serve him the wine we've got. Right? It's not it's not good enough. So they send their servant down the street to, to the wine shop to buy some better wine to uh, to serve to this uh, to this resident they've got hiding in the house. And um, and the guy in the wine shop's like, why are you buying such fancy wine? You don't normally buy this wine. And the servant's like, well, you've got a bit of a you know, distinguished visitor. Say no more, say no more. And, um, and then this leads to the discovery of the fact that, that, the, um, that this person is hiding in the house. And he is then, you know, the, the, uh, the soldiers storm into the house and go, we believe, we have reason to believe you have a person of high status hiding in this house because you've just bought this fancy wine. And then he comes out and they kill him. Um, so this is the this, 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 is, this is real. This is a real Roman story. But he's basically caught out by the hierarchy, the class hierarchy, mapping onto the wine hierarchy, and so um, that's how seriously they took it. Wow. Um, you, you know, it's interesting, and and uh, I, I'm now starting to feel the clock pressure here. Uh, you know, we're two drinks. Yeah, we've got a lot of drinks to get through, and we've got, we've got to start knocking it back really quickly. We, we, we okay. do, but 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 I want to say about wine that that uh, and someone raised this question uh, or raised this issue in our audience, which is that um, it's very interesting that that two great religions deal with wine in two very different ways, and uh, with Christianity and Islam, you know, basically dealing with some of the same religious texts, uh, some of the same uh, uh, concepts, etc., and they just go, whoo, two different ways on uh, the subject of wine and alcohol. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and wine, I mean, the religious use of wine is much older than Christianity, and um, Christianity seems to borrow its religious use of wine, you know, from earlier, you know, the um, uh, Mithraic cults and uh, I think the cult of Bacchus. I mean, Bacchus is a, a wine god who dies and comes back to life again. Sound familiar? Um, so, I mean, that that idea, um, you know, that you know, Christianity soaks up a lot of these, a lot of right. these things. Um, and then Islam ends up with its own, um, its own. Well, there's a big debate about whether. Because it looks as though Muhammad did actually drink wine, and it looks as though he didn't say you shouldn't drink it. He his his, his opposition was not to actually to alcohol; it was to intoxication, and that was then taken to mean that you shouldn't drink it at all. Um, so subsequently, um, and this is a you know it's a, just like what happened with Christianity. You get a whole load of stuff that Jesus says, and then you get what subsequent you know interpreters said, and they say things like, "Well, we've decided that what he meant was this." Um, so therefore, you know, priests all have to be men and have to be celibate and, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever rules they come up with. Um, and this seems, you know, it always happens with all religions. Right. Um, and so what happens in Islam is that uh, is that people say, well, um, the prophet said you shouldn't drink wine. Um, and uh, and it, uh, intoxication is bad. And, and then when coffee shows up, what's really yeah, interesting is that right. is that, you know, then there's an argument about whether. Um, drinking coffee counts as intoxication, and what and coffee comes to be known as the wine of Islam. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves there. But uh, but yes, I mean the the religious use of wine is is um you know it it, it, it pops up in in a lot of religions. Muslims all over the world are saying, "Oh, thank you, he dodged that bullet." But so well, um, I'm drinking wine. Well, no, I'm, no, I'm, no. I, mean, no. I, 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 I think I think the Quran <laughs> gives you. I think there is. I think there is there is room for interpretation. Um, and I know people who are supposed to be Muslims who are possibly, you know, 
open to you know being a bit flexible on that on Moving that question. On. And Moving I think on. that's I think there's basis for that. So Tom. Um... Getting back to wine, are we still on wine or are we moving well, forward? I, you know, Chris, if you think we still have time for wine, you know. Well, I just had one last question. Going back, oh, okay, never mind. Moving right ahead, <laughs> moving right along. All right. Chris, go ahead. Let's talk more about wine. Yeah, uh, go, go. Let's do one more wine. Let's, let's, let's do one well, last yeah, question. Well, yeah, come on. Now, we're, right. now no, we're no, all going to want to know what the wine speed question round, speed was. Round. I was going to bring up that great wine snob, Plato. Uh, and he, he, you mentioned in the book that he said was that wine was the test of man. What did he mean by that? He meant that if you really want to, and this, this again is, I think, something we, we've, we would recognise, that um, if you really want to know what someone's like, then kind of get drunk with them and you'll see their true character. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think people would recognise that today. I mean, if you know, you go to you, uh, the, the Japanese the Japanese tradition of, you know, you go to the, uh, the uh, business meeting and then you all have to go out and get drunk together and they have the special you know, bottles of whiskey behind the bar and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's the kind of ritual way of bonding bonding with people. And it's exactly the same idea, which is that um, that's how you kind of really get to know people and and, um, uh, and really sort of see who through to who they are and therefore whether it's safe to do business with them. So, yeah, that's a uh, that's a very, very, you know, I think I think we'd all recognize that. And it, of course, in some cases, People, you know, become very different when they're when they're drunk and uh, and not at all pleasant. And then you go, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's, yeah, so we're, we're on our way to finding out. Uh... It's a mood enhancer, but uh, so, so we know alcohol is a mood enhancer. But it's also sort of you know the argument is it's a character enhancer. It makes it sort of emphasizes people's characteristics for good or bad. For so good or bad. I, I confess that my own personal interest uh, is, is is to move on soon to coffee, but we we don't want to oh, don't want to forget distilled distilled spirits. So one of the interesting things in the story of distilled spirits is, if I remember correctly, is as he's pouring his bourbon, which is made oh, yeah, from yeah. corn. Um, At least fifty percent of the mash bill has to be corn. That's right. Is that the um, that it is sort of odd that these distilled spirits in a very real way come out of the teetotaling Arab world. Um, sort of. So I don't think the Arab, the Arab, I'm not sure the Arab world was quite as teetotaling as we thought it was. And they come out of, um, uh, they come out of the Arab scientific tradition. So, uh, an awful lot of, so the word alcohol, (laughs) al means the, right. (laughs) Um, it basically means the essence of something. Um, so this, so spirits were originally called the alcohol of wine because if you distilled wine, if you, uh, so what we would now call brandy, you heat it up and you take the uh, lighter um, fractions off it and then you recondense them, you get this much stronger liquor, um, and you could do that multiple times. Uh, but then algebra and you know um, algorithm, I mean, these are all Arab words um, because they had this incredible this scientific, scientific re- revolution, yeah. exactly. And then there was the then there was the fundamentalist clampdown on. No, actually, we're not going to drink any any alcohol. Um, but yes, they figure out distillation. I mean, there are some examples of distillation that go back further. So there are uh, Mesopotamian examples, but they're not distilling alcohol. They seem to be distilling um, perfume, and they use this uh, sort of drip distillation method where they they heat something up and it kind of condenses on the lid of a vessel, and then it. Anyway, never mind. That's another story. Um, yeah. So, so uh, what ends up happening is that uh, Westerners, uh, Europeans, learn about distillation. So, distillation is not known to the Greeks and the Romans. So, the the strongest liquor they've got is, you know, um, is sort of probably fourteen percent or so. The kind of the, the strongest you can make wine or beer, uh, and any any stronger than that, the alcohol kills the yeast, and so you just can't ferment it any further. Um, and then what happens in in the uh, you know the Middle Ages, we we get the knowledge of the of the Arab scientists spreads into Europe, and uh, people start figuring out about distilling stuff, and they start making what we would call brandy or whiskey, uh, but essentially they're distilling either beer to make whiskey or wine to make brandy, and they discover that it's incredibly potent. I'm just going to have a sip of it now, and it, it's it they start to talk about it as a you know whiskey is. Um, is derived from the the is it the Celtic or the Gaelic? I can't remember, for, but it means water of life, and it's because uh, it was seen as a miracle. You know, it can bring people back to life. You know, you, you have a shot now; someone will give you a, a tot of whiskey, and it will kind of bring you to your senses, wake you up, because it's just like so so bracing. Um, there's a there's a lovely quote um, that I put in the book from someone who says, you know, when someone's on their deathbed and and you want to give them the uh, the energy to say their their dying words, you give them a little bit of brandy 
and then it kind of you know shocks them and they they you get one it, more they, sentence after yeah exactly exactly and then they die um and there's a story of, <laughs> of, of, a, of a king who is um you know he's very ill and so he's a king so they can afford this so they wrap him up in sheets that they've doused in alcohol because it, it's, you know, it's a wonderful you know miracle cure it can fix everything and then a careless candle sets the whole thing alight and he burns to death so yes it, it goes up like a human camp so um but yeah so this is so this is a, a it is an irony that it's it, it, it is the uh, the knowledge of alchemists another word that begins with al um in uh, in, in in what's now iran and iraq that that comes into europe and people go hey this is really awesome and what's great about it is that if you're in northern europe um, so you're in, you know, the beer drinking band of Europe. So that would be sort of England, Scotland, you know, Germany, um, etc. You know, anywhere north of that, um, you weren't able to to make wine. I mean, there's a bit of wine in south, southern England, like there is now, but uh, during the Roman period. But essentially, it's not really warm enough to make wine. So you're having to make beer, which is usually lower alcohol than wine. And also wine, um, you can store for long periods. Beer, you generally can't. And so you might as well drink it when you've made it, which gives you the kind of northern binge drinking culture versus the southern <laughs> drink with moderation culture. Hmm. But what distillation allows you to do is it allows you to make a much, much stronger drink uh, that you couldn't make before. And that's why you get the emergence of whiskey in you know, Ireland and, uh, and Scotland and you get vodka in Russia. And so suddenly northern and then you get things in, in Scandinavia as well. So northern Europe is suddenly like, OK, now we can make really strong drink. And so uh, so that starts to happen in the, you know, in, in that period because they're using this new technology. And, and then they start to play football and then everything goes That's south right. after that. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> well, football and beer is more your football and drink. Right, right, I think. But, but, yeah. but Chris, Chris, can you take us to to coffee here? I'm. I'm oh, we're I'm, skipping. We're just. Well, well, I mean, we. Well, could, yeah, we need to. So, so what well, I want to talk about I, the slave trade. We should, and we should, the, let's yeah, skate yeah, over it trade. very quickly because I mentioned it earlier with the slave trade and the currency. Yeah. But, um, but essentially, you've got whiskey, you've got brandy, then, and you've got whiskey, and then you've got um, uh, so, then you've got rum. And you've got the whole use of rum as a as a currency. But essentially, what happens is that the um, you get this triangular trade. In fact, you get two overlapping triangles in the uh, in the Atlantic. But because of the the rise of the sugar islands, and sugar is this very labour intensive crop, and so European powers start to use enslaved people on the plantations in in um, in the West Indies, and they end up with these leftover molasses, which they don't know what to do with. And then someone figures out you can make rum with them, and so you end up, and then you use the rum. Um, because the people on West Afri on the West African coast that they're Almost getting the slaves yeah. from, they don't have access to distillation. And so they think this is great. And so they'll take rum as and brandy as payment right. for the slaves. So you, then you take the slaves over to the West Indies and then you have them make the sugar. And then you send the sugar to Europe and then the leftover molasses are used to make rum, which you then use to buy more slaves. And so you end up with this self-sustaining, you know, horrible system. Um, and so that's, you know one of the ways that these drinks connect to history um that that rum and brandy really are sort of powering that they are the currency behind that whole trade um and you also get this in the in the in the early u.s colonies uh, before it's the u.s so in the early american colonies they are um you know they, they're having real trouble they can't make wine <laughs> they haven't got grapes um and uh you know they're having trouble getting european crops to grow they were sure they would just be able to transplant them all and it doesn't work um instead they can take these molasses from the from the West Indies that people don't really want and are and the French islands are pre actually prevented by law from making into rum because that would compete with the brandy industry in, in France. So they can get this French uh, molasses really, really cheap and then make it into rum. And this is what then leads to um, you know, the beginnings of uh, complaints about no taxation without representation and the Sugar Act and so on. What that is, is the, is the government in London trying to stop the um, the American colonies from doing business with the French islands because the French are the enemy. And here they are buying all this molasses from them. And the main export of New England at this point is rum. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly economically important. And yet it depends on the enemy. So they start trying to ban them from doing this. And the American colonists are like, well, hang on a minute. Why are you trying to mess up our main industry? Yeah. And by the way, we haven't got any say in this. And what's that all about? Yeah. And so the first cries of no taxation without representation and, uh, and all the rest of it, actually are all about rum and not about tea. And John Adams writes um, around the turn of the, around 1800, he says words to the effect of, you know, basically American independence um, 
uh, was all to do with molasses. And I don't see why we should you know, be and rum. And I don't see why we should be embarrassed to say that. So he doesn't attribute it to tea, which is, you know, how it's sometimes described now. Um, it really does all start with molasses and essentially the extent to which the American colonies are allowed to be economically and politically independent. So cheers. Cheers. OK, Rick. Oh, all right. OK. Fine. And I'm, in, I'm drinking bourbon here. So I've now arrived in the oh, new world. I, I have done the, the beer is almost out. I have a little. Oh, bit my. Left. You are so far okay. behind. It's not the even. Wine, so... The wine is here uh, and I've got my spirits are, are pretty drunk here. Yeah, I mean, I we're wanna... going to want to skip over the caffeinated drinks. I mean, apart from I mean, coffee is the most fun. And then after that, <laughs> no, I, I, I do want to just mention that we are talking to. Well, we're still sober enough to mention it, that we're talking today to Tom Standage, who is the author of The History of the World in Six Glasses, and we're three glasses in and three glasses to go. Chris, do you want to you wanna yep, move yep. us forward? Okay, so now it, it, um, you talk, we're going to move on to coffee. Uh, you mentioned that 1652, we have the first coffee house in London, and uh, you, know, you can touch a little bit about how we get there, but... Coffee rise in London, and then it takes off. It it takes off like mad. It takes off like crack. Um, you have first <laughs> coffee it's... house in first, first coffee house in London, sixteen fifty two. Uh, Ten years later, there are eighty three coffee houses, and it only goes up. But then it just goes up to eight hundred. I mean, I yeah. worked I worked it out. The number of coffee houses per person in London in sixteen seventy, I think it was, is higher than than it is now right and we think there's like starbucks everywhere but yeah, yeah. actually it was you know coffee was a massive thing um but obviously it took off in the arab world first and it was because they you know weren't allowed to drink alcohol um coffee houses became the the, the social the local place that you would go and you would play backgammon or whatever and you would um and you would chat with the you know, with the with your friends and and uh and you would drink coffee and it became this very important social drink and there was a um, there was a better political reaction to this because, um, you know, could we trust this? Can we trust the coffee houses? Aren't these sort of hotbeds of political instability? Which was true. Um, and so coffee was actually put on trial in, um, I can't remember which, which city, but it was like in the, in the 1470s or something. Um, they literally put a vat of coffee in a courthouse and said, we're going to try you. Um, and what they were trying to work out was whether coffee breached the, um, the injunction that you know the prophet had said you shouldn't drink stuff until you're intoxicated and this was why you know they weren't drinking wine because wine makes you intoxicated um and coffee sort of also makes you intoxicated if you drink enough of it you kind of get the shakes and you know um and so there was this question of did that count as intoxication and coffee won the you know won the case and was was uh, was you know not convicted um <laughs> because um because actually there were there were people who were using coffee to stay up all night in order to pray and it was sort of used in, in some rituals and so it, in other words coffee was making and if you if, you, if you're going to do the, the full thing where you have to pray at all the different times of the day that you're supposed to pray then coffee is really helpful because it can help you wake up in the middle of the night and it can keep you awake and so on and so on so the, the general conclusion was that coffee makes you more devout and that therefore it was blessed and this initially meant that coffee was frowned upon in europe because it was called the wine of islam and oh. so should we be drinking that well that's what the the muslims drink and you know we're christians so we don't oh, want to drink that Clement here. <laughs> so it's brought exactly so it's brought into to italy and it's initially again like spirits it's and like wine and like beer it's a medicine and people go there's this amazing thing and it kind of peps you up and then of course it becomes a miracle cure that can fix everything like all of these new drinks always are it's like oh we've discovered a new drink it can fix everything and there are all these pamphlets saying it's great and it can fix everything um and the story goes that the pope is you know asked to try this and he he tries it and he's an italian and he goes oh i like it um, <laughs> um and so the, so then then you know the prohibition on and the idea that this is you know, something that if Christians shouldn't drink is taken away because uh, because coffee is so wonderful. So coffee then spreads like wildfire through through Europe, and in particular in in London, um, you know, by this stage is becoming you know Britain is becoming a trading nation, and uh, people are starting to bring coffee in. And so here we are. Here's a coffee house, um, and I love this because it's another internet. So the coffee houses were a sort of internet of the 1660s because you would go to coffee houses would all specialize in, in discussion of different topics so all the sea captains would go to one and the insurers would go to another and the scientists to another and the clergymen to another and so on and so on so you could kind of ramble around the coffee houses and go to 
um, different places to hear discussions about different things. And it was also where the pamphlets, the newspapers were di discussed and, and distributed. Um, and it was also where you'd get your mail, because this was before there was street numbering. So you would say, write to me at the Rainbow Coffee House. And then someone would say, you know, write to Tom Standage, Rainbow Coffee House, uh, London. And that would actually arrive. And so you would go to the coffee house to get some coffee, check your mail, and check the news. <laughs> and so it was basically it's the there. internet. Um, yeah, quite. And then it also sort of um, spurred innovation and this idea that, you know, scientists would get together and drink coffee and come up with new ideas or commercial innovation. So Lloyd's of London is originally a coffee house, turns into the insurers. Um, the London Stock Exchange, originally a coffee house called Jonathan's. So you get all of these new um, scientific and commercial innovations that come out of coffee houses because they are places where people and ideas can freely mix. And this is because of the custom in coffee houses that um, distinctions of class would be left by the door. So it's the anti wine in so many ways it's the anti-alcohol because the idea which persists today that coffee sobers you up it doesn't really sober you up it makes you think you've sobered up but it doesn't really sober you up i'm afraid um but it's the anti-alcohol in that sense but it's also the anti-alcohol because wine is this drink where it's all about your social rank and you know it's like the boss is coming to dinner we better get a better bottle you know we still have that idea today that you know there's this sort of social ranking in wine that doesn't happen with coffee coffee is you know it's it's the drink that that you have at conferences, that you have at coffee mornings, that you have at church after the service, that you have, you know, at business conferences, academic, you know, it's the it's the drink of collaboration and uh, and cooperation. And that, again, you know, is something that still persists today. So, yeah, it's the drink of innovation as well. What do you what do you have? Uh, you know, brainstorming meeting, you have coffee. Well, now you're just on Zoom, but, you know, you used to have coffee. And <laughs> that was, coffee yeah. that, that's what you'd have. So so I love this. It's my it's, a, it's one of my favorite periods in, in history. Uh, this whole you know the restoration period in London where there's there's coffee there's scientific revolution there's this kind of internet and it just feels you know if I can have a time machine I I either want to go there or to uh, you know the late Roman Republic or the Victorian the high Victorian period but probably if I had to choose one I'd choose 1660s London because it just you know it floats my boat but the coffee <laughs> would have been horrible the coffee yeah. would have been absolutely <laughs> disgusting because they had to, it was they taxed it it was regarded as a form of beer. So, again, the tax laws were like, well, what's this? Well, you sell it in you know, places that also some of the time sell beer. So it's kind of beer, but it's a weird kind of beer. So you had to make it up, a whole barrel of it, and then pay the tax on it. And they would do the X on the barrel um, to show that you paid it. And then you could reheat it and serve it to your patrons. Yum. So And then also you'd keep it warm in a kind of pot that was on the fire all the time which would just be boiling it down more and more and more so you know how when someone leaves the coffee machine on at work and then you come in on a monday and the whole office smells of coffee and there's a kind of treacle in the coffee machine and, yeah. uh, and it's probably like that's all melted and yeah yeah that's basically what it was have been it would have been revolting which is one of the reasons why people had to mix co um, coffee with sugar which then drove demand for sugar right, and then right. you know, we're back to this again but anyway that's um so it's it would all have been tied in together yeah, it's, it is. Yeah. But I, we would not, I, with most of these drinks, if we went back in time and drank the historical versions of them, we probably wouldn't like them. The it tea's probably bad. okay, but the coffee. Bleh, no, so, so, so then, top. How do we get from coffee to tea? Yeah, because so especially, ask, in, yeah. Go ahead, Rick. No, no. I'm, Chris and I have the same question. But before I ask it, I'd say I did, there was, apropos to what you said, there was the fellow who said that coffee. Uh, had the consistency of soot and tasted like it also so that was yes no of, exactly there's so many so many references in, we, in we, um, we know what it 1660s like. and 1670s sources where where people are just rude about the, the taste of old shoes or socks or boots or soot or you know it's not they're Starbucks. really rude about it but on the other hand it it you know it sharpens your mind and people up until that point were europeans would have beer for breakfast right they would in fact they drink beer and wine throughout the day um and suddenly they've got an alternative, which instead of dulling the mind, kind sharpens you, it. So is it any yeah. wonder that we get the scientific revolution, we get the enlightenment, we get, you know, the French revolution. Suddenly people are like, hey, the Greeks might have been wrong, you know. Um, <laughs> heavy objects don't fall faster than light <laughs> objects. Let's try it. And then they, they, they invent science. But then but then I have to I have to take Chris's question, which is in, in, in 1700, coffee is all the rage in London. Everyone drinks coffee. No one drinks tea. A hundred years later, everyone, everyone in drinks Britain tea. Oh, is well, there you go. Tea, and yes. no one, well, hardly anyone, yeah. is Pinky drinking up. coffee. It certainly what over yeah. happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so tea, tea, funnily enough, does arrive in London about the same time as coffee, but it's much more expensive because it's being brought from China. So it's coming a lot further than coffee that's coming from the Middle East, and that makes it much more expensive. 
Um, but it's very, so it's very expensive and it's very light. And what happens is Charles II, this is 1660s, um, he gets married to Catherine of Braganza and he's promised that he's going to get, as her dowry is going to be a, um, a chest full of gold or silver or something. I can't remember what it is. Um, and in fact, he's given a chest full of tea, which he's very disappointed by. Um, but it means that tea drinking becomes popular in the, in the court in London. Um, and in fact, what he gets by marrying this um, princess is um, access to trading posts around the coast of India, which gives the uh, the British access to uh, the east and, and uh, you know, pro you know, essentially uh, footholds that allow them to get to China. And they, so the, the British East India Company um, starts to, uh, so the English East India Company um, starts to bring in large amounts of tea. And one of the things that makes tea particularly attractive is that the ship's captains were allowed to bring a certain amount of stuff of their own and then sell it. And the amount that they were allowed to bring in was regulated by weight and not volume. So that means you're looking for something that's very, very light, but very, very valuable. Um, because then you can, you know, have masses of it, but, um, but because you're being, you know, you're allowed a certain number of tons of it. And so tea fits the bill perfectly. And in fact, it's worth more than its weight in silver. Um, and so, so the East India Company captains start bringing enormous amounts of tea into London and meeting this demand from the, um, the aristocracy who want to drink it because the king is drinking it and everyone in the court is drinking it. So tea starts to become really, really popular. Um, and it becomes a kind of, like with wine, a means of connoisseurship, you know, so people will, will have their own blends made and they'll say, have you got the, you know, have you heard the latest kind of tea or the latest mix of tea and, and so on and so on. So tea starts to have this social cachet um, that, that coffee didn't have. Um, and then it just becomes so widespread. So it's just like what happens with wine in the Greek and Roman worlds, which is where it becomes so widespread that even the poorest members of society still have um, access to it. I mean, very, very bad tea, uh, you know, kind of left over from, you know, the, the thrown away tea grounds. And the other thing that's happening is, uh, is that tea is being adulterated. So to stretch the tea that's being brought in, it's mixed with sort of bits of grass and dust and any other rubbish you could get hold of. So tea is about 50% not tea by this point. And one of the reasons that we drink um, black tea uh, whereas, you know, the, the kind of normal sort of tea in China is the green tea, um, is that when you adulterate green tea, you need to use green things. And that generally means heavy metals, copper, stuff like that, which is really poisonous. Um, so it was very dangerous to drink green tea because it was adulterated with things that would kill you. Whereas if you drank <laughs> brown tea, it was adulterated with like rat droppings and, you know, dust and bits of grass. Oh, yeah, and it, good stuff. Yeah, it wouldn't actually kill you, though. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be heavy metals. So, um, so, so Europe then focuses on black tea instead of green tea um which is regarded as a sort of weird thing to do by the chinese by the way um and so yes tea becomes extremely widespread and then it forms the basis of this you know of the east india company and the british empire and the trading which is that um you know we're basically sending all this silver to china to bring the tea back and then we decide we don't want to pay them in silver because we're running out of silver so we decide to start paying the chinese in opium which we grow in india and then we use that as and it's fantastic yeah, currency from that. our point of view because we can grow it on trees and then when we hand it over to the Chinese, they smoke it and it goes away. Um, so it doesn't have the same in, in monetary impact. So you get this terrible system where basically drugs are being traded for tea, which is being brought back. And then you get the opium wars and you get the British Empire and the whole, you know, the whole thing. And it also fuels the, the Industrial Revolution as, as a result of this um, thing we mentioned earlier with reducing the infant mortality rate and allowing people to live closer together in big cities you do that much more easily everyone's drinking tea which everyone is and they're getting all of their calories from jam um and tea basically sugar sorry not this <laughs> um yeah so it, it all goes together it all goes together it, it tea seems so benign and yet as you say it's responsible yep. in part for the independence of america the ruin of china through the opium trade the uh, uh, well, the rise of, of the British Empire is it's all revolution. fueled by tea. Absolutely, yeah. So pre pretty wild. So we're 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 on to we're we're on to our last. Ah, uh, you're away. Okay. I got it, man. Out to the Coke have, and you can drink I, it for all of yeah, us. Yeah. I have some. Co I haven't had a Coke in years, so I am going to have a little Coca Cola. Now, and it's a I real think, one, there. It's a full fat one. It's I, not I one of know. these. No, and not I don't Coke do Zero or something. And, and I think I think Tom that a lot of people know kind of the the basic history of Coke and the idea that it oh it had some cocaine in it, but then uh, and cocoa and where it came from, and that it was uh, a, a big uh, uh, drink during uh, times when uh, when alcohol was was banned. Um, but I want to go right to a specific story here because it also 
circles back to a story you told that happens in uh, a, a, of a trial of coffee. Coffee is put on trial, but gosh darn it, Coke is put on trial too. Yes, it's put on trial in the, in that, the 1920s. Um, and, and this is the name, yeah. this is the actual yeah. name of the federal yeah. case. Yeah. The United States versus 40 barrels and 20 kegs of Coca-Cola. Ladies and gentlemen, who's going to win? Yeah, well, so they, funnily enough, the Coca-Cola, um, they were accused of, um, so Coca-Cola starts off as a medicine and, uh, and it's, yeah, it's got cocaine in it. That's true. Uh, they take the cocaine out quite early on, actually. So coca leaves, coca leave extract is still used, but it's decocainized. Um, but the, the, the specific issue um, in that trial is whether it's suitable to market Coca-Cola to children because it contains, co sorry, not because it contains cocaine, because it contains caffeine. caffeine. And uh, is basically, is it bad to give caffeine to children? And, you know, children have been drinking tea probably for a while at this point, but coca has really quite a lot of caffeine in it. Um, and they win the case on the basis that, um, because it all comes down to whether caffeine is natural or not, and whether they've been using natural ingredients or not. And they can actually show that everything in Coca-Cola occurs naturally, because what does natural even mean? It doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it's a totally stupid word. I mean, you know, nuclear bombs are natural because humans make them. And computers are natural. I mean, I just, I don't know what. I mean, if, if the definition is occurs naturally in nature, then, you know, almost nothing is is natural. Your corn is natural. Cows aren't natural. Chickens are natural. They do not occur on their own in nature. They are the result of human intervention. A chicken is a man-made technology, right? We bred it. It's not any different from a skyscraper or a microprocessor. It's something that humans made. But anyway, don't get me started on that one. Um, so it comes down to they win the case because they, they can show that they haven't been putting anything unnatural in it. But they then voluntarily say, we will reduce the amount of caffeine in Coca-Cola. So they cut it in half at that point. And if you drink Jolt Cola, which is another cola you can get today, it has the original level of caffeine. It's about twice as much caffeine as Coca-Cola. Um, so they, they deliberately reduce it because they say, even though they won the case, they're going to, you know, well, fair enough. You know, if you're worried about that, we'll reduce it. And they also promise not to target children with their marketing ever again. Now, you may have noticed that that's not, not the case. But um, what starts to happen in the 1930s is that Coca-Cola starts to use Santa um, as you know, a big part of its marketing at Christmas. And people start to say, well, hang on a minute, isn't that targeting children? And then they say, no, no, that's not targeting children because <laughs> everyone loves Christmas. And, and more recently, more recently, this, I mean, this was a, there's no legal reason why they have to do this. This was just totally, the Coca-Cola company said, we are gonna, you know, we're gonna lay off the marketing to children. And obviously more recently they are, you know, they have ch you know, children in their adverts and so on. So they've, they've let all that go by the board. The idea, by the way, that Santa wears red because of the Coca-Cola company is not true. Santa was wearing red. That was, you know, the, the, the color that Santa wore was <laughs> most often red uh, uh, by the 1880s. Um, so, but Coca-Cola jumped on that bandwagon in the 1930s and said, well, since he wears red, perfect person to market Coca-Cola. And if children tend to pick up on it, well, really, what can we do? <laughs> Nothing to do with us. So, um, so yes. Did they all go on to cigarette marketing later? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if Santa gets involved in that one. Yeah, what does Santa smoke? I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you what he drinks, and he likes to drink Coca-Cola. Oh, 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 oh. Well, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I think he probably wants some of this, actually. Yeah, I think probably it, so, yeah. It's cold up north. I, 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 you know, I, I think our audience would be disappointed if I didn't mention the ghost army, so I'm, I'm just going to... Uh, uh, really? It, it, it would be. I think that means I have to drink something. Okay, yeah, cheers. There you go. Oh, he's in on the tradition. So, um, but, but uh, and I know we're wrapping up here. We'll just go a couple of minutes long. But this is a, a photo, uh, Tom, interestingly, I thought, from 1945. And these are the American soldiers here at a German building in March 1945 and they happen to be soldiers of the Ghost Army but that's not important oh, to the story. There's a Coca-Cola yeah. sign up there. Yeah, yeah. There is a Coca-Cola sign there and if you looked at that sign very carefully you would see, you can't see it in this version, you would see that it doesn't say drink Coca-Cola, it says trink Coca-Cola. It is in fact a German sign, uh, not an American sign. That is actually a Coca-Cola sign from before World War II and when I saw that, I started researching it and discovered, not in your book, but if you do another updated version, yeah. you know, you can squeeze it in, is that one of the things that the, the Germans loved Coca-Cola, and now they couldn't get any syrup during the war. They kind of hoarded the syrup they had, and when they ran out, uh, people started working on a substitute, and one of the substitutes that they came up with was Fanta. Which is disgusting. Which is disgusting. <laughs> And I, we, we talked about this. I think the good engineers were all involved in the Messerschmitt and the Tiger tank and the Volkswagen, <laughs> and the bad ones were working on the Fanta. But yeah. so that that's uh, uh, Coca-Cola had 
penetrated worldwide even before yeah no absolutely World War but, it, but, but, but well it, it penetrated into other other certainly into european markets um but but what made it go global was world war ii because the coca-cola company said um we are you know we think they basically managed to get the u.s government to make declare coca-cola an essential supply and they said <laughs> we will make coca-cola available to the to the servicemen everywhere but in in return you have to uh, basically say that because it's an essential war supply um, we have access to sugar because without sugar they couldn't make it mm. and so this is a very very clever ruse that um that and also the you know all these letters from american servicemen around the world saying that it reminds them of home it reminds them what they're fighting, they're fighting for, for coca-cola yeah there are examples of like fighter aces who you know they 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 are fighting over a bottle who gets that whoever shoots down 10 germans or 10 japanese planes first gets this bottle of coca-cola um so there's all of this sort of um cultural uh, association with it which you know has subsequently become much more widespread and is used against america so you get you know when you have anti-american protests and we've seen this recently you know, during the gulf wars and so on you know there'll be people pouring coca-cola into the street or whatever as a way of criticizing america what happens when the berlin wall goes down um you know uh, east germans rush into west west berlin um to to get, buy consumer goods and coca-cola because it stands for all the things that they couldn't have and it stands for Western consumerism and globalization and so on. Now, when I originally wrote the book, in, in, I wrote it in 2004 and it came out in 2005. Um, that was the kind of the height of the enthusiasm about globalization and the idea that everything in the world was moving to a single global market. And Coca-Cola was sort of the, the essence of that, distilled essence of globalization in a bottle. And um, the funny thing is, I've recently, so just the um, beginning of this year, uh, a new edition of the book, Updated, has come out. And I went back and looked at it. And the part of the book that was had dated the most, because most of the book is like hundreds of years out of date, and the part of the book that had dated the most was the stuff from the beginning of this century. Because um, obviously people are much less keen on globalization than they used to be. And we've had all those anti-globalization protests. But also they've turned out to be much less keen on Coca-Cola. So the idea that, that you know drinking soda is a bad idea and maybe you shouldn't be doing quite so much of it. Maybe you should be drinking bottled water and this, you know, the rise of, of bottled water and, and sort of health drinks and, and, and so on. or or Coca-Cola with the sugar taken out. So it turns out enthusiasm for, for Coca-Cola and globalization peak at exactly the same time. And uh, and sales of soda have been going down, sales of water have been going up, which is the seventh drink in the in the book. Um, so it actually reinforced the thesis that Coca-Cola, the shine came off Coca-Cola, just, you know, the fizz, it lost its fizz just at the <laughs> same time, just at the same time that globalization lost its fizz as well. And in fact, if you look at the numbers, globalization has been in reverse since the global financial crisis, since about 2007. So you did it yourself. You killed globalization yeah. with this book. That's yeah, I, no, I think Coca-Cola, no, Coca-Cola okay. didn't do it either. Coca-Cola Coca Coca reflects it. I, I think that's the point. Some of these drinks really drive things and um, in some, and they kind of, it's a mixture. They drive it and they reflect it. And so that's, that's what happened here. But, you know, most trade in Europe and Asia now is regional trade. It's not trade with, you know, people elsewhere in the world. So, um, so globalization has been going backwards for about the last nearly 15 years now. And, uh, and sales of Coca-Cola have, have peaked as well. Well, Tom Standage, we had to go a, a six minutes long, but we got all six drinks in. So here's to that. <laughs> Cheers. Yay. Cheers. Have a toast there. Thank you so much for joining Thanks, us Tom. today on History Happy Hour. And good luck with the updated version of your wonderful book, which I uh, have really enjoyed reading oh, a yes, second that's time the updated this last cover, week. Yeah. A History of the World in Six Glasses, which actually gets the word the in, which the original title did not. Yeah, we, did, we didn't get to that story, did we? No, but yes, we that's didn't. True. But people can look it up themselves and figure it out. So, Excellent. Tom Standish, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been Thanks, great. Tom. Cheers. Take care. Oh, my goodness, Chris, we've gone a little long. I, we have. Uh, I, I, my guilt factor is high, but, but I have <laughs> one more minute to go because I, I want to do a history, uh, a history, history all around here. us. Well, and, you know, so in sight of my apartment, uh, Chris, is this building, uh, which is an apartment building one street over on uh, South Wabash, 1321, I think, South Wabash. But it wasn't always an apartment building, and that fact is... Um, shown by looking at this front entrance and you see the words coca-cola i do in fact over see the, the entrance and in fact this building was built in 1903 as coca-cola's chicago headquarters and chicago was actually only the second uh city in the u.s where coca-cola did a uh, a syrup manufacturing plant um, which they originally did in another building but then they moved to this building that they built and they had their offices on the lower floors and the syrup manufacturing on the higher floors, which I would have thought you'd reverse that, but that's yep. what they did. 
and it is in fact the only surviving Coca-Cola plant from before World War II outside of Atlanta. And it is on the ah. National uh, uh, Register of Historic Places. Little factoid. All so right. just, just right outside the, just that way. But just, just that way? Just that, you've seen it, we've walked by it <laughs> together, have. yeah. And so next week, Chris, tell us about our, uh, our, uh, our topic next week. Uh, next week we have um, a discussion with uh, David Michaelis, who's written the uh, latest and probably the most comprehensive biography of Eleanor Roosevelt ever done. And uh, what I like so much about the book is it really puts Eleanor front and center um, in the story of Roosevelt's administration, uh, his, uh, uh, the years before the war and then World War II itself. Uh, and then probably, since it's you know now a theme of ours, Maybe we'll have martinis next week to go with the Roosevelt. I'm ready. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I want to thank Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours for hosting us on their Facebook and YouTube pages. So, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll all be touring again in, in uh, 2021. So thanks everybody for joining thanks, us. And uh, sorry for going a bit long, but hope you enjoyed it. Stay thank safe. You.